attempt to. There were 23 trains that would come through in a day. <laughs> yeah, that's how I got there on the train. But I can't remember the, the place very well. O C K E R T? Uh huh. Okay. John. Mm hmm. L. John L. I got a John J. It is Monmouth. Is he your but son? My son, yeah. He teaches, he taught, teaches he, at Galesburg High School. Oh, he used to teach at Southern, didn't he? He did, yeah. yeah I mm -hmm. think my daughter maybe had him. Mm hmm. Okay, so you were in the Navy. Uh huh. When did you go in? I went in in 1944. I was uh, 26 years old, a father, and I'd, I was drafted out of Borden County, but I went to Indianapolis to go through the free draft, you know. And uh, the what? Oh, the when you go, went in for the draft, for your mm -hmm. physical and all that stuff. And I went to uh, Indianapolis because I lived in. Kingsbury, Indiana. Oh, okay. I worked in an ordnance plant there, just like the one in Burlington. Oh, the big okay. ordnance plant. Kingsburg. Kingsbury. Barry, yeah. Indiana. Uh -huh. Indiana. Indiana. Yeah. And that was an ordnance plant. Mm -hmm. How'd you get out there? Oh, when I got out of school, I tried to find a job, and mm -hmm. my wife had a friend that was a personnel officer in this ordnance plant, so he got me a job working for the operating manager. How many children did you have? Just when two. You, when I you just had one. Just then? One uh, that's the, the boy okay. teaching in oh, Galesburg. Okay. <clears throat> well, anyway, I went in there and uh, after I completed the physical, we were walking down the hall there and the fellow that was recruiting for the Navy was just closing up shop. He was picking up his chair and he'd gotten all the people he wanted for the day for his quota. And I saw him there and I went over and I told him I'd sure like to get in the Navy. Could he take one more? He said, well, I will take one more and uh, let's be one I won't have to get tomorrow. <laughs> so you, you um, when you're drafted then, you're just drafted and then you, they assign you your, normally or? or Wherever they want you, yeah. I see. But because you're from Warren County, they sent you the draft notice. Yes, I, I went out of there. To fill Warren Rutgers. County, Illinois. Mm -hmm. Okay. But I did. I mm -hmm. chose to go to Indianapolis for the physical exam. Mm -hmm. so. so I walked into Great Lakes that, that night about 12 o'clock. It was my 26th birthday. Really? Mm-hmm. So what really, were you thinking? Really, really celebrating. <laughs> So then I went through boot camp at Great Lakes, which was eight weeks. And then I was sent to service school for 16 weeks. And then Where I did you go there? At Great Lakes. Still at Great Lakes? Great Lakes, yeah. So I was there for quite a long time. And what were you being trained for? I was a yeoman, which is a secretary. Okay. That type of work. So when we completed the the training there, why well, I, I was assigned to uh, <coughs> a ship out in San Francisco, and I sent out was sent out to Treasure Island, and that's when I went through the, the USO there. Okay, the North Flat. Uh -huh. Well, what was your what was your impressions? I mean, did you know before you got there? No, I didn't. I was very impressed with the place, but I can't, I just can't remember it too well. I can't. So did the, the conductor tell you to, that you were going to get the train off? Stopped, the train stopped there. Uh -huh. And I think most everybody got off and mm -hmm. went into this thing. It's kind of a, a routine thing, I think, to stop trains there for right. that. And uh, it, was, it was nice. Uh, I know it's just really above and beyond the, the call of people to do with all that, mm -hmm. that, that really took a lot of effort Oh, for all those months, and 24 hours a day, and it was really quite a... We talked to a lady from Wapolo that actually went there when she was a teenager, mm -hmm. and um, she worked there, She and they mm -hmm. came all the way from Colorado, her family, they had 
some of the people that supported that came all the way from Colorado to mm -hmm. bring food and gosh, how and about that? And and that's um, and all of it was tax free. Yeah, no, no tax money involved. Wasn't well, that something? That's really unbelievable. Mm -hmm. It really needs to be written up. Yeah, and told about. Yeah, there was, um, you know, we were. Like I say, it's it's something that you really can't even believe that it yeah, actually. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that were actually happened. Uh, what ship were you assigned to at San Francisco? U.S.S. General Stewart. S T U A R T Heinzelmann. S T U A R T. Okay. Heinzelmann. H E I N T. Wait a minute. H E I T T Z Z L E M A N. H e i t z l e m a m a n. M, yeah. I'm sure glad that. <laughs> sure glad you could spell that. You no, know, I went to uh, to Arlington Cemetery mm -hmm. several years after that, and uh, as I was wandering around in the cemetery, that I ran across the tombstone of that General Stuart Heinzelman. Oh, really? That the ship was named for, yeah. Hmm. It was an AP, they call it Heinzman AP-159. What's that mean? Uh, personnel, I guess. Oh. Was it a, a carrier or, or No, it was a pretty good sized ship. It had a crew of about 400, and we hauled about 3,000 troops. It was a troop ship, so it was. Oh, okay. Where did, it, where did you head out for then? Well, we first, first thing we did, we took a, 3, 000, okay. a, a group from, from San Diego to Japan. To Yokohama. Hmm. And, uh, and we went up to the Philippines, Manila, and picked up some of General Douglas MacArthur's people and took them back to Japan. And then, uh, these were prisoners, or what? no? These no, were the people that were discharged, oh, being discharged, oh, and okay. people that were well, the people. Uh, MacArthur's people were not discharged. They were going over there because that's where he was. He the was occupation charged. force. Occupation, so this yeah. is after the war. This is all occupation. This is after the war. Mm -hmm. uh, when you went from uh, San Diego to Yokohama, that after was... After the war. This is I after the war. I was very lucky that I was assigned to this ship. The reason I, it was so long was they hadn't built it and the government hadn't accepted it yet. So I think we were about four months sitting in San Francisco waiting for him to... Yeah, it's a past infection, you know. Well, how long did you, you went in, you said in 44? In 44. And then you got uh, out? October 22nd of 1944, and I got out in May 46, something like that. So I really wasn't in too long. I was pretty fortunate. Mm -hmm. October, I'm sorry. October 22nd, 22nd. my birthday. Okay. Now, I remember you saying yeah. it was your birthday. I just didn't, I had 44. Okay. And I think I got out in May of 46. May of 46. On the West Coast? Yeah. Where? I discharged in Oakland. Okay. I had to come back to the Great Lakes to get my actual discharge, but I got off the ship at Oakland. One thing being on a crew transport, we never sat any place very long. We, we were in and out of every port in the West Coast, and you are always going someplace, you know. Mm -hmm. So. I kind of like that. Were they real cramped? Some of the I've been oh, it was terrible. It was terrible. I've been reading some several books about that time, and they they really say the conditions it were was awful. awful. Just awful. It was terrible. I went down in the troops thing was uh, where they had all these three thousand troops, and it'd been rough, and they were seasick. And, oh, it was just terrible. Oh, my. Well, it was they awful. then they couldn't take you know shower. You know, the, the, no. just the perspiration and you know and it was hot it was awful mm -hmm. it took us say I can't remember now but it was around 10 days to go from San Diego to Yokohama might have been nine or eight I don't know well where were you at when they dropped the bombs then I was sitting, sitting in San Francisco still, was waiting, was still waiting for the ship to be commissioned was that a real surprise to the troops that that happened, or? I kind of think it was. I don't think they had realized what this was going to do. Mm -hmm. It saved millions of lives, both yeah. sides. Yeah. That would have been a real severe. Because everything I've read so far, the, the Japanese, they, 
whether they were an officer or whatever, if they went into battle, they they would die no matter what. Yeah. I mean, they would either, if they didn't die because they'd been shot, they died, they'd kill themselves. Yeah. You know? Well, we so, had somebody tell us that, that they wouldn't that, surrender. They I would saw the movie them. about the letters to Iwo Jima here. They just I have not, out. It's I not out on DVD yet. yet. Yeah. And, and they, uh, a lot of those people just, uh, they, they were there to die. They were not going to give up. So there were very few survivors. And that very if we few. would have invaded Japan, that's yeah, what I wonder. It would have been terrible. It would have been awful. Yeah. And one of the one of the books said that they felt as though that you know that that so many of their leaders committed suicide that that helped in a way with the war getting turned you know more towards us because they you know they were you know if they went into a battle they would kill themselves if they didn't yeah that's true I hadn't thought about I hadn't thought about that yeah. but maybe that was a was a roundabout mm -hmm. help to us but. Well, we made one trip to, uh, I guess we were going to Japan. They called it the Great Circle Route, good circuit around the Aleutian Islands. We hit a typhoon up there. That was, re that was really something. What do you, does everybody go down below then, or what, I mean, what happened? I didn't go any place. I just uh, stayed put, because, it, 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 you know, the ship would come up out of the water, and the screws would be up in the air there, and it would... Uh, shake the whole ship. It was a pretty rough day. Did you uh, lose anybody overboard or anything? No, but it could have very easily been, but it had gone up over side. Mm -hmm. side. I had uh, an officer that had a typewriter and a file cabinet and and a table and stuff and it broke the weld on all those and all that. It just tore that all loose. We had to go into uh, Seattle to the shipyard up there to get the the bow hammered back in and get it down in and it was super up. Hmm. That was a real storm. Just the force of the water. Just a real storm. That was a, a fright. We had a crew of about 400 and I'd say 390 of them were seasick. I was very fortunate never to be seasick in my life. And really? Just from the, the biggest thing I'd ever been on had been a rowboat. Right. <laughs> Just yeah, well, pretty I fortunate. That would have been fortunate. Yeah. But that was probably the most scary thing that ever happened mm -hmm. to us was in that storm. Well, when you dropped them off in Japan, where did you, where did you, just different places then? No, we just went to Yokohama that each time. Each time. The only two places I was ever in was Yokohama and Manila. And I went, I went it on these trips. Because that's where we always went to. Now, Yokohama. Manila is, I'm just trying to remember. Philippines. That, Philippines. That's north of, of uh, Guadalcanal, right? That would be north and, north and west of the Guadalcanal? I'd have to get a map. I don't know, Judy. I'm not sure either. Think, I've been mm -hmm. trying to get these places in my mind, and it seems like that, that was, it's quite a bit further south than what Manila is, yeah. I think. Yeah. Was the Guadalcanal, was that where MacArthur held out for such a long time? Well, or? the Marines did. MacArthur was in Australia. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he was yeah. in Australia. Yeah, yeah. I to, I'm reading a book now about, I mean, that that was, they just left them there. You know, I mean, they couldn't get, they just left the Marines there. Anyway, some of the hardships, I have to, I, you know, they're just. What did your wife do? Here, you've gone to the Navy. You're in Great Lakes. She's got a child. She Did she stay in Indiana or what? She had, We lived in Laporte, Indiana. And uh, she couldn't she couldn't make it on what my salary was. I was just, a, uh, the highest I ever got was a third class petty officer. But I wasn't in very long anyway. And uh, I think, I'm not real sure, but it kind of seems to me her money was about ninety dollars a month is what her take was and i got fifteen <laughs> well did she come back to warren county she, she, no she went with her folks lived in south bend indiana so she we she gave up the home we had there we lived in a in a housing project in uh, that the army that the government built in the port and then uh, she had to go back home And she stayed there during the war. Mm -hmm. Then when I got out, we came down here. 
down here meeting Warren County? Yeah. And then what did you do? Farmed. There was land in the family, so I farmed. When did the other child arrive? While you were... In 1950. Eight years of difference. Is this boy, girl? The boy was the first, the girl was the second. She lives in Antioch, Illinois. And is retired already. Yeah. yeah. Worked for the state of Illinois. She audited public aid offices. Oh, my. Yeah. <laughs> what a job. She traveled and traveled a lot. She's retired now, so... And so you've lived the rest of your life here in mm -hmm. Warren County, mm -hmm. on this place? No, we lived in Roseville, in two places in town. Then we built this place out here in about 77, I think, to be 78. So my wife's been gone 12 years. I'm 88. We've had some discussion with some of the gentlemen that we've talked to about um, the Red Cross and the Salvation Army. Did you have any? I had not meaning? really no connection with them at all. Mm -hmm. No, I didn't uh, have any need of either one. Mm -hmm. so. How did you keep in touch with your family during the war? Just wrote letters. Letters? Uh -huh. Well, you were still stateside though. Yeah. I was a uh, yeoman and a uh, on the ship, I had my typewriter. I, my job is writing the ship, ship's log, which is the history of every minute of the ship, you know, whatever else was it. Every day, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Hmm. Uh, it's a stand watch, you know, and then the, the officers would write the events of, during their shift, and I, I had to type all that up and turn it and give it to the captain, and the captain sent it and eventually got to Washington. Even before the ship was launched, since you were assigned no, to no, the ship? No, 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 after they commissioned it and we set, set out to with it. I didn't know. You know, we talked to one gentleman down at the, the Veterans Home, and he was one, doing some research, I don't even remember what it was, and he had written to some department and gotten, it was $600, he said. It was turning on the light. That's why he wrote for the log. They were out in the Pacific. Oh. And uh, during the Battle of Leyte, yeah. uh, the uh, Philippines, and some of these uh, aircraft gear, aircraft were large, and they'd overflown their carriers and couldn't, and there weren't any bases that they could land, and so they had this plane circling, trying to find a place to land, yeah. and they turned the lights on the ship uh -huh. so he could land, uh -huh. but they had never turned any lights. No one had ever smoked on top. I mean, no lights whatsoever, yeah. and uh, they saved this guy's life, what yeah. they did. Yeah. Yeah. And eventually, uh, they had got hit in the catapult, but didn't make any difference because the plane was too large for them to launch anyway, so uh -huh. they eventually had to just push it into the Pacific. Uh -huh. But that's what that was about. I will tell you one kind of amusing story. When we were in Yokohama, the second, second or third time, I don't remember. There was a big barge right along beside us, and trucks kept coming out and dumping Japanese rifles, ordnance and stuff on this barge, which they were going to take out and push all that stuff into the sea. They won't want to get rid of it. So being right beside, we'd run over there and grab a rifle or, you know, some of this stuff and bring it back and to bring it home. So about this third day we were out of Yokohama on the way back to the States. The commander said he was going to have a search at the ship. So they searched every nook and cranny on that ship and took it all up above and tossed it overboard. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Did anybody get in trouble? No, no. no okay. They just knew that they didn't want it back in the States. You mm -hmm. know, and they, we had enough stuff there to almost have an army to <laughs> furnish. So that it all went over the side. <laughs> that winter souvenir. Yeah. Uh, okay. 
Well, did the the, the uh, troops that you brought back then, did you have any interface with them? Not too much because uh, they were in, we had our quarters and they, they had theirs and I really didn't. I don't know that I even knew one. Mm -hmm. We were entirely separate mm -hmm. from them. They they were chowed different place and everything. Mm -hmm. So when you say you wrote the log, I mean what? Then they like the officers would give you the information and then you would have to he write had, it up. He had, he had a log book and, and they would write anything that happened on their watch. Now, this was in land or wherever you were. You, you had a, a a watch going, even if you're sitting in Oakland or someplace. Mm -hmm. And then I would take all these watch lists for the day, and it had our position at all times, in where we were, and all that. And I had to type all that up, and it had to be perfect. <laughs> it's supposed to be. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'd turn it into the, send it into the captain of the ship, and he would. I suppose he did eventually yeah, he'd send those all to Washington. All that stuff went to Washington. Like, for instance, what would let take a half an hour? I mean, would it just? I don't Might know. not be anything. To speak. Well, of. what would they? What would be some of the? Like they saw another ship, or what? I mean, what would they but be writing? I don't even know. Something like that. Yeah. It it just really wasn't really wasn't much to write about. Mm-hmm. Because we didn't ever see anybody much or anything, and. Uh, so they would just say, come seas, or yeah, whatever. Yeah. Proceeding as before, or something like that, you know, and wasn't much to it. So but was it in half hour increments, or, or didn't they? Oh, I forget what the watch was. I think it probably, I'd say maybe four hour watch for the officers, and there'd be some enlisted men, too, would stand to watch. That was another one of my jobs. I had to, when we got into port, I had to, have a watch list made assigning all the people the the hours watch, which was not real popular. Not the most popular <laughs> thing that there could be. That was part of my job. Mm -hmm. I was the navigators, yeoman, and the gunnery officer. Yeoman's what I was. So I guess that was a navigator's job to see that they had the watch going all the time. And that would be, how many people would be doing that? See, I've never been on a ship. I wouldn't have yeah, know what we're talking about. Probably one officer. I don't know really how many. And these are the people that are standing up wherever the highest point, whatever, just well, they're, making the they're, ship. They're usually the gangway where, where they'd be. I'm not positive of that because I never, I never, all I did is get the thing and type it out. <laughs> <laughs> and they knew you did it. Yeah. First time I ever did one, I sent it in and it came back because the captain said that the officers needed to learn how to write up a watch. Some of these guys were just new, new guys too. Right. So he wouldn't accept the thing. So they had to do it all over again, and I had to type the thing again. So. And that was before computers and. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was, had an office, and uh, the the Marine detachment. There were maybe twelve Marines. I don't know. There was a Marine officer and ten or twelve Marines assigned to the ship. And I was in the same office with them, and I got got very be very good friends with those those guys. And uh, I remember we played basketball down in the hole down the, there. We used to have basketball games, and the uh, you know, it's pretty slip slick slick down there at the bottom of the steel mm -hmm. thing. And, the guy broke his leg, so the Ooh. captain said that's the, that's the end of the basketball game. So we didn't. Do it anymore. Well, I'll tell you one more thing. Are you bridge players? I played, but not. I'm I not played years ago. I haven't played probably in ten years. Well, years. anyway, four of the Marines wanted to learn to play bridge, and I I had to learn to play a long time ago. So I said that I would uh, teach them. So every night we'd sit down and and uh, have our bridge game. 
and not, I was not an expert or anything, but I didn't know how the game went, so I teach these guys, and we did that for oh many many nights, and and finally they got so they could play on their own, and that left me out. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I guess that's a, a good teacher. <laughs> yeah, I taught myself out of a bridge game. Do you have any any of the guys that you still keep in contact with? There was one, and I, and he's dead. Yeah, there's some of my I would I sh really should have kept in contact, but they didn't keep in contact with me either. Mm -hmm. So. So you've never uh, your ships never had a reunion then? No, never did. Oh. I'm not positive whatever happened to it. We came in to, to uh, San Francisco, or it's in Oakland. Every time you come into Oakland, you come in San Francisco under the Golden Gate Bridge, you know. And uh, I, I didn't know where they were going to go next, but I figured I was going to be going, and the, the first class petty officer came along and said, would you like to get out? We could. Uh, let you out if you can you get enough money to to get home and I said you better I'll get the money to get home <laughs> <laughs> so I got out out there again and took the train back here to Great Lakes did you go through North, North Platte then too I think I, I think I did mm -hmm. I think I did both times going out and coming back Yeah, that canteen was really started by one woman. She had the uh, the idea to do it, and then made it happen. You know, yeah. well, a lot of people made it happen, but yeah. oh, yeah. Yeah, they got themselves organized. And oh, there was a local dairy in town, and so they gave them these little half pint bottles of milk. Mm -hmm. And they had a coffee pot, a uh, great big, huge coffee pot that uh, they'd used in World War. Well, I did I bring that? Um, World War II, yeah. this, uh, World one. Uh, one, World one, yeah. yeah, that was um, fired by LP gas. Uh, you might want to look at, if I get the right page here. Today, they tore down the North Platte Canteen. Oops. Whoops. Yeah. And so this is all that remains is a, a memorial to that canteen. Uh -huh. And the Union Pacific, of course, owned it. Yeah. And this is what where it was. Yeah. But they no longer had any use for the building because they no longer had passenger service. Uh -huh. They offered it to the town for a dollar, and the town fiddled around, and finally the Union Pacific got tired of it, and they tore it down. <laughs> I'm sorry they did. Yeah. Mm -hmm. This is a list of all the towns that had contributed, which is 125. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, here's yeah. some of the la here's the lady that organized it, yeah. Ray Wilson. Yeah. God. Fantastic. And whoops, I turned too many pages. That's her picture again. Just some pictures of the canteen in general. Mm -hmm. Serving various things. Uh, they talked about other people have told us the sandwiches were piled high as haystacks. Yeah. Uh, boiled eggs were a real seller. Uh -huh. Well, not a seller because they didn't charge, but people yeah. really, really like them. There's this is a coffee pot. That's a coffee. And this little boy wanted to help so bad and had no money, so he went to the sales ma sale barn and sold his shirt. <laughs> really? Every sale. It's in the book. Mm -hmm. I'll be darned. And raised a lot of money for the canteen that yeah. way. I'll be darned. He didn't have that money himself, but he made it. And uh -huh. these are just pictures of ladies who worked there, and they're taking down the canteen sign. Uh -huh. um, How did you girls happen to get into this? I mean, was it, was it just... Well, we have, we have a book club that was started about three years ago. Yeah. And um, there's, a, the, there's a reading program to get people to read. It's nationwide. And so we decided... A year ago that we were going to promote a book but most of them are like Dallas or Denver or whatever mm -hmm. so we thought well we'll just promote it for all of Henderson County because we don't have a big city mm -hmm. and so we had a book last year and then it was it was primarily geared toward women 
Yeah. And so we wanted to have a book that would have readership for men too, and we thought and thought and thought and thought. And this was the first book that we ever did in our book club. Mm -hmm. And we picked it and it, you know, we've been very, very, very pleased. A friend yeah. of mine gave that to me to read about four years ago. Uh -huh. And uh, so it's amazing how life just, you know. Yeah. So. Uh, this, this was really a, really a worthwhile. And they right. would fill up your coffee cup, and you could take it on the train, and then the train people would bring it back to Okay. from the next stop. I would have remembered that. I'm not a coffee drinker. So. Okay. In North Platte today, they have this memorial, 20th Century War Memorial, which memorializes all the wars in the 20th century. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is a big deal. It's like a $2 million memorial. Yeah. They have right. uh, bronze statues here in the beginning. Uh, you can see it right here. Mm -hmm. They have these bunkers that have bricks in them that uh, people's names, what their service is. Uh -huh. And then each uh, branch of the service has a statue. And well, there's the bunkers again. Uh -huh. And then back behind you're, you're looking back here is this wall that has these uh, friezes mm -hmm. or um, murals on them mm -hmm. of every war. This is World War I, uh, World War II, I can't see what that is, but some of them are uh, the various wars anyway mm -hmm. in the 20th century. And it's all carved out of brick. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then they have a um, granite marker for the canteen. On the back of it has this etched picture. Mm -hmm. And on the front of it has uh, the names of all the towns. Uh -huh. They have memorial benches. They have these, uh, for lack of better things to call them, cubes that uh, tells about each war. Uh -huh. there's this. And there's an example of what the, a brick would look like. Uh -huh. This is their visitor center right by the war memorial. Uh -huh. um, North Platte is the biggest train makeup place in the whole world. Mm -hmm. The Bailey Yards. Okay. They make up trains 24 hours a day, mm -hmm. seven days a week. And now, why do they not the passenger trains go through there now? Did they reroute those? Amtrak. I Amtrak see. did not pick that route. I was to California and I asked her about going through North Platte. No. She said she doesn't. So. Did she go through Denver? Yeah. Okay, then she goes through McCook. Mm -hmm. which is in the southern part of the state. Mm -hmm. um, downtown North Platte, there's this big mural on the wall. Uh, that's their courthouse. This is a downtown scene. That's some pretty nice pictures here. They're all clickers and buttons. And they have a big elevator that is locally owned. Uh, in the book, they talk about this hotel. Mm -hmm. It was the Pawnee Hotel and the Fox Theater. And today, uh, during Nebraska Land Days, which is coming up in June, they'll have a, uh, a play that tells the history of the town. Mm -hmm. And, well, that's my husband. We were out there talking to the editor of the paper, and uh -huh. we took the quill along. So someday you'll see my husband's picture in the quill if you take the quill. And this man works for the Historical Society. Uh -huh. Well, that's great. And the, um, that, that spirit from Nebraska... Um, we found out through a newspaper clipping that there's a gentleman out there who, I guess he owns, he's wealthy, he owns several banks. It's a pa Pawnee Banks, is it? Pinnacle. Pinnacle Banks. And he has been doing this anonymously, um, but somebody, I guess, just found out about it. But ever since the Iraq War started, he every serviceman from Nebraska that has been sent over to Iraq, they send them $400. Really? And, yes. um God. To Nebraska. To Iraq, the money goes over there, yeah. and they and yeah. some of the servicemen were using that and buying candy and giving it to the kids, and uh -huh. yeah. so that that spirit that mm -hmm. that was there is still, you know, is yeah. still going on. Yeah. And today, well, and they've also uh, we don't need to record this. But well, because we just set up a home there. It was I tell you, it was a, it wasn't much of a home. I'll show you a picture of it. Okay. <laughs> I'll find it here. Oh, okay. Okay. They built a whole bunch of those. Oh, mainly for the Kingsbury Ordnance Plant employees to live in. What yeah. did you make there, can you say? Yeah, we made uh, 
Same thing as they did over Burlington. Burlington. Only we were small, like uh, we were 81s and 105 millimeters, and they were using big, bigger stuff over here. Mm -hmm. Made a lot of 60s <coughs> and 20 millimeters and 40 millimeter shells, the smaller stuff. Mm -hmm. It was a big ordnance plant. Was it underground too? A lot of it? No, all above ground. Because I know the ordnance plant over here. There's a lot of it that's underground. Well, there could have been some out, out there, and the, I never was out there much. I was in the operator manager's office all mm -hmm. the time. I was in charge of specifications. It was my job. Was that something you liked? Because when you got in the Navy, there was, or was that just something that it just happened to just fall happened. into that? And you know, they kind of, uh, I don't know, see what you, maybe your most aptitudes are in the when right. they, and mm -hmm. they figured that was best suited for that. So, mm -hmm. that's the reason I got in. And you knew how to type. I knew how to type. I had to had to learn shorthand. Oh, for heaven's sake. And I gave up shorthand because all these guys in the shorthand class had, had had two or three years of shorthand in high school, and I was starting from scratch, so they were on page 75 when I was still struggling <laughs> with page one. <laughs> so I, I just never did do it. Uh -huh. It really didn't amount to anything mm -hmm. anyway. But I will, I'll ask down the Legion if ever anybody mm -hmm. was through there. We'd appreciate that. And uh, if there is, I'll... Let do, us I, do I have your number? If you don't, uh, let me see. I'll get no, I can write it down on something here. person's over here. Mine's over there. But I'll ask. I'm going to go to that supper tomorrow night, and uh, I'll ask if anybody... Mm -hmm. Yeah, we'd really like to, mm -hmm. to talk to them. You know, and I'll kind of ask around here too. The, but they're getting thinner and thinner on the oh, yeah. mm -hmm. people that have been through there. Yeah, that was our first home. We had her. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Mm -hmm. Wasn't much of a place, but it was ours. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> When did you go to in <clears throat> when did you go to that ordinance plant? I mean, were you did you go before you were married? Uh, you no, I got married. I got married when I was in college. Where did you go to school at? Knox. Mm -hmm. I uh, we got married in April and I graduated in May. So we we lived in Galesburg there in an apartment. What year was that? It was 1941. What, what was your yeah, uh, yeah forty one your degree what were you studying just bachelor of arts degree is all my major was history hmm you still enjoy history yeah and uh, you're gonna love our program this is <laughs> this is a history yeah real history person uh, yeah it's good it's good. So were you did were you brought up on a farm then? I lived. I was a townie. I lived in Roseville. Oh, okay. And uh, my father farmed. In fact, they had this farm here, and uh, I did work on the farm quite a little bit and stuff like that. But mm -hmm. I was raised in town. What did you do after you got married? You said that's 1941, so we've got three years here. I worked in that ordinance plant. Oh, after you got married, then mm -hmm. you went to Indiana. Mm -hmm. Okay. See, her folks, her folks lived in South Bend, Indiana. Her father was a uh, uh, was the head of the metallurgical department at the University of Notre Dame. Her dad was. And they were not Catholic either. Hmm. And uh, she went to uh, school right across the road from Notre Dame in the women's college. How'd you meet her? <laughs> she came down to Knox her fourth year. She went to this college across from Notre Dame so she was a finished her junior year and then she had a friend that was going to Knox, so she came down there to and did her fourth year at Knox. And what was her degree in? 
the same as mine. Mm -hmm. Okay. Monarchy has a good reputation. Yeah, it's where it gets built. Yeah. It's too bad people can't afford it around here anymore. Yeah, getting but so, getting so there too too much. Well, my two grandsons are. They went to Northwestern, mm. and when they got out of Northwestern, they finally decided they wanted to go to law school, so one of them went to the University of Iowa, and the other went to Tulane. Mm. And they finally got out, and they passed the Arizona bar exam, but they still don't have bar jobs yet. Oh. <laughs> but they, they did pass the state exam, mm. for, which is not too easy. No, you? I don't think it is. Some of, these, uh, some of these states make it real tough, but they don't like to, like California and Florida and places where it's kind of a nice place to live, you know. Mm -hmm. They make the exam pretty mm -hmm. tough to discourage. Well, Arizona is one of the fastest growing places in the nation right now. Mm -hmm. Of course, they don't have much water. You know, they're, <laughs> you know, they're both living, they're living out there. In the, They've got a job working. Each of them are working for the Arizona Republic newspaper right now. Really? In the advertising department. Yeah. Huh. Oh, I, I hope they can get a law job some of these days. Well, nobody can ever take that away from them. Yeah. They don't have any in, no, with anybody. You know, or no mm -hmm. cousin, no uncle, nobody that's mm -hmm. in law. So. Yeah, but you never, you never know. You never know. You meet people through your life. Mm -hmm. Sometimes make a connection. Especially if they're in the newspaper mm -hmm. business, they're out and about, I yeah. think. Yeah. yeah. My oh. eyes water, that's what I'm doing. Yeah. <laughs> well, you have quite a project here. I think it's a really worthwhile project to work on. Thank well, you. it's been it's been wonderful to be involved with it. It really mm -hmm. has. It just is. Well, it was an outstanding endeavor out there. It really was. It's, mm -hmm. it's hard to believe. That those people could do that, that did for that long. Well, and to come from all over the state, it wasn't just around North Platte. As far north as Valentine and O'Neill, which is right up at the South Dakota border, mm -hmm. people came down and ran that canteen mm -hmm. and sent supplies. Yeah. And this was when the tires were rationed and the yeah. gas was rationed, yeah. and that you know. And then one of the ladies, on, you know, was saying that. You know, they made their own mayonnaise, they made their own bread. You know, it wasn't like they went to the grocery store if they ran out. I mean, they made, they had to, you know, kill their own chickens. Yeah. It, it was yeah. a completely different world that way, and mm -hmm. that makes it even yeah. more unbelievable to me that... But you they said the guys really yeah. liked the eggs and the milk because they got powdered eggs oh, and the milk. Oh, yes, I know all about the <laughs> powdered eggs. They said they were, the eggs were green. A lot mm -hmm. of them said that they Pretty were... Bad. Yeah. So I guess the eggs, they went through a lot of hard-boiled eggs and the milk. That, that The soldiers really liked that. Yeah. On a ship we had, uh, if we ever had any desserts much, it was usually raisin pie, and I hated raisin pie. I don't like raisin pie, never did, never will. <laughs> <laughs> you sound like my husband. When he was in the Army, they fed him banana ice cream. Oh, my. He can't even eat bananas, <laughs> let alone <laughs> banana ice cream. I'll tell you, uh, my quarters out there in uh, San Francisco were really great, though, on Treasure Island. Do you know what Treasure Island was where they had the World's Fair out there? Oh, okay. And the Navy took that over, and uh, uh, they made a base out of it, and it was, it was really quite mm -hmm. a nice place. Well, that's down down near the, not too far from the Golden Gate Bridge, isn't it? It's uh, on the other, the Bay Bridge. Right. Right, the Bay Bridge, right the Bay Bridge goes over to Oakland. Okay. Right about the middle of the thing is where Treasure Island is sitting there. Mm, I had to go home and get my pictures out. <laughs> a couple of years ago, about four years ago, we went to San Francisco. We went across that bridge. I know that. That's the Bay Bridge, brother. That's where the that's where mm -hmm. we, get, we get on the train there to go in this, to go in every night in San mm -hmm. Francisco. It was pretty hard duty. Going <laughs> and, uh, Did you go to Chinatown? Oh yeah, went everywhere. Went out to. The prison out there, after, oh, yeah. uh, Alcatraz. There, Alcatraz. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It was still a prison then. Wasn't yeah, it? I think it was. Mm -hmm. No, let's see. I believe it was. Yeah, yeah it was still I think prison. it was. Yeah. Yeah. The pool was there. Yeah. 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 Been there. I mean, oh, maybe maybe it, a little bit later. 
it, it hasn't been shut up all that long. Yeah. Yeah, no. I remember the first night I went ashore into, into San Francisco. And there's a, a, we go down and get on the train, the train run in there. And the, I saw all these guys carrying their peacoats. And I thought, that's crazy here. You're going in there, it gives a nice out there in the, in the daytime there. And got in town, like it froze to death. It's cold, it's cold in there. Yeah, good night. Well, you're right off of the water there. Yeah. yeah. One time I was out there and they had, I don't know what the, what, they were jets. We, I w we were down, well, you know, you could see the, the Golden Gate Bridge over there. And um, three jets came and flew under. Ah. <laughs> I mean, it oh, was. Oh, I bet they got in trouble. Yeah. No, no, that was part, it was oh, part, part of, of the, a, the show. Of a program oh, okay. Whatever. And I can still see that. It was like, oh my gosh. Yeah. Just as fast as they're going in one little Mistake could be. Ooh, yeah. 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 I'm surprised they let them do that. I yeah. am. I am too. Mm -hmm. I am that too. was that was something else. The day we are one of the days we went across the, the Golden Gate Bridge is when they upped the terrorist alert mm. to red, mm -hmm. and they had to stop the buses and they oh stopped my, everything. Oh my! They been backed up for miles. Well, they they were only we were on the right side. We were across the bay mm -hmm. from San Francisco. And they were stopping the ones coming from Sanchez. Yeah. So we were on the right side. Yeah. They didn't bother us, but you could see just what you said for miles. Yeah, and, it and it was rush hour, too. And it would be miles. Yeah. And it was rush hour. Mm -hmm. And every car, every bus. <laughs> I can't remember now why, but uh, I had this red alert. And I have so. a niece that lives in San Jose, California, so I go out there some. And we go oh, yeah. San Francisco, so mm -hmm. It's a... You can relive old times then. Yeah, that's right. So, well, we thank you for your input. Absolutely. Well, uh, I don't know if it the word the OPA headquarters in the old name. That's where the headquarters were. And I'm in charge of fastening tires and shoes and that kind of ration stuff. And so I can't tell you. I said, well, I'll tell you what, fellow. You're going to have the FBI here in just a little while, because I'm going to call them for attending the bribe. <laughs> the government <laughs> rack. So anyhow, they kept the code. I don't know what the FBI did to Ron or to bring the Senate, but that was enough for me. I called General Arnold, commanding general of the Air Force. Oh, at first I called General Wright, my commanding general, and he said, well, why don't you talk to half, half an hour? Last minute, I ain't going to call General Arnold half. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So anyhow, I called Jim Arnold's office, as per my instructions, and uh, told him that they were going to make a crook. These people going to make a crook out of him, one of his officers. And I told him the story. He said, okay, give me a little time to work on it. About three days, I got a letter from the War Man Park Commission and the OPA. I was released from duty in OPA. I was no longer in the jurisdiction of the OPA of the War Man Party Commission, and I could go to work in my old job, because I'd just gotten a job that somebody before working for the bank. You know? Well, that's so, nice to know they're responsive. They were... Oh, yeah. You see, what I, I found about most of the people, this has been my experience, a lot of the enlisted men were, it, by inference, that officers walked on air. Is that your experience? I never did think so. <laughs> I mean, maybe you did, but some, a lot of them did. Oh, yeah. Probably fear. Maybe. Oh, it was fear. And I'll tell you what, the colored troops, they, in many cases, they were really mistreated. That, on Guam, they were terribly mistreated. I know that, uh, I, to me, they, they were, I was so happy to be able to have some colored troops to learn to become aircraft mechanics or, or servicing and aircraft, you know, with fuel and bombs. And you couldn't tell whether they were white, blue, or particularly in the dark, you couldn't tell whether they were white. Oh no, they're... but anyhow, uh, so you and so you went to work for the bank then. 
I went back to work. I went back to work at the bank, and that's where I stayed. Did they do anything to those people? For I never knew. I, 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 I didn't even know who sent it to it or anything else. And I, I don't, I don't know what the, if they did. I'm sure they didn't do anything to Romberg's, but no, I never, never found out who the person was. I, I got a feeling in my mind. I think I know who it was, but. Well, one of the things I, that I thought was interesting, I found out in the book either that there's a documentary that PBS did also on this, this, this story, yeah. is that, you know, the rationing, you know, these people from Nebraska would have to drive, you know, from these distances yeah. to, to service the canteen. And it wasn't the gas that they were, it was the tires that oh, they yeah. really had. And I had always thought about the gas, but... It was the tires that they really had to... See, see the tires in the pre-war days did not have the life. Mm -hmm. No, they were terrible. Yeah. Yeah. And they were really rationed. I mean, you know, I mean, and I, I just, that was just a new piece of information. See, my, uh, my, May I interrupt yeah. you? Uh, the bank, was it in where? Where was in the bank? In Chicago. In Chicago. Well, it's headquarters in New York. But you worked in Chicago, and it's yeah. what, the Manhattan Bank, did you say? Chase. Oh, Chase? The Chase. Okay. All right, sorry. <laughs> I just want to get it right. But anyhow, you don't have to, don't, don't use, do any advertising for Chase. No, They're no. They're getting enough of it. <laughs> no, I'm just going to say bank, but I, I want to have my... Okay. And then you, yeah, they so do. You, when you got out of the service then, you... I went back to high school. Oh, you went back to high school? Under the GI Bill. I finished high school. I graduated early. I went, I should have graduated from class of 45 instead of class, graduated from class of 47. But I graduated on November 5th, 1946, and uh, under, the, under the GI Bill. And I never went to college. I started at junior college here in Burlington, but uh, they had me too heavily loaded, and I couldn't keep it up. Mm -hmm. And uh, but I became a uh, I, I drove truck for Allied van lines. I then became a tool room machinist, and. Uh, then uh, I worked at the ordnance plant as a, as a silver machinist until uh, early 1954 when the Korean War was over. And then I uh, couldn't find a machine shop anymore. I got laid off. So I went back to work for all our families. So in the meantime, I went to the employment office and uh, uh, I met a young lady there that I knew who she was. She knew who I was, but we had never really met her talk. I took her out for a cup of coffee afterwards, and uh, she's the one I've been married to for 51 years. years. But uh, I kept, you know, asking her to marry me, and I'd bought a set of rings and everything, and, and she just wouldn't commit herself. And uh, I was, we were going to go to uh, St. Louis or something over the 4th of July day. And uh, I had to tell her one night that I won't be able to go because I'm living in Peoria, Illinois, or Phoenix, Arizona, and I'll be gone over the 4th of July. She said, that's all right, honey, we can do that after we're married. No. <laughs> so, well, that was a fun trip down to <laughs> So, so uh, that just goes to show you to, you chase a woman until she catches you. Yeah. <laughs> that's what I had to tell her. That's right. <laughs> but, uh, it's, uh, and it's been a wonderful marriage. You know. Anyway, I, uh, after that, I, I gave up. My brother and I, my twin brother and I, uh, had our own tractor, and we leased out the Allied van lines. And I wanted to get off the road, so I did. I went to work in the machine shop. I found, found a job there. And then I went to work at the old International Resistance Company here in Burlington, and as a tool, uh, tool room machinist, and then I became a tool maker. And then I was studying engineering at home at night. And uh, I was invited to go into engineering as a junior engineer. And uh, then things progressed. I worked there 24 years. And I was chief engineer. And I got laid off and moved out of Burlington to Corpus Christi, Texas. And I wouldn't go with him. Mm -hmm. I went into business for myself and he and everything else. Oh, okay. I've been studying that on the side and doing both that. And I decided that thing I'm going to do that. And then I sold that business the first day of 1989. The night of when? 1989. And retired. I did, well, I've done gunsmithing since then. Uh, did a lot of gunsmithing. I gave that up because of liability. 
You couldn't afford the insurance, and you couldn't afford to be without it. Yeah. So, and of course, I joined the lodge way back in 1953. Masons. I've been a Mason for 53 years. I saw you read. The, the VFW then, or the American Legion, you, I saw you had a VFW. Right, both of them. Then do you belong to the... I belong yeah. to the Legion, I don't belong to the VFW. What is the difference? I don't, I mean, well, probably. The, <laughs> well, you, for the Legion, you have to have been in service during the war. For the VFW, you have to have served yeah, overseas see. during the war. Yeah. I see. Yeah. Um, I'll say it again, for, and for the American Legion, you have you to... You have to have been in service during the war. Yeah. During a war. But, but it doesn't matter where you're at. Yeah. And for the VFW, you have to have been in service, and or you had to have served overseas during, during the that war. period. Uh, see, he, you belong to both. Don't I belong to both, yes. You see, I only joined the Legion because I had some very good buddies of mine that were in the Legion. <clears throat> I've never, never joined the VFW, and I figured now, at my age, no point in joining another organization. I'm, I'm a uh, senior vice commander of... Uh, I probably I should have I, I should have probably joined at the same time I joined. But uh, now, if you if you are just in the service period, and, then you can, and anybody anybody, anybody can, can join, join the American Legion. Legion. Anybody, but you no, in order to no, go. Oh the, no, that's right. You got to have to have been in service during, during the a war. war. Yeah, that's I right. Did that's right. not know oh. that. Did not know that. But they didn't have to be overseas. You had to be overseas during a war for the VFW. Yeah, yeah but right. just to be in the service does not get you into the American Legion. No, I tell you, the guy that I got in the Legion with was Bill Graham from Davenport, Iowa. And maybe you never heard that name, Graham Motors. Uh, he was the distributor for Studebaker Motor Vehicles. He is distributed. He had sub dealers all around. You know what I mean? And I got acquainted with him because that, he took me down, they had the, their post was Snug Harbor, you probably heard of that in Davenport. Yeah. I have. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it was a good place to go. And Bill and I were friends, uh, I mean, and, as well as business acquaintances, you know. So he asked me and I did, and I never, I probably should have, I've often I told the kids I should, because I can prove them at my dis and all my records, you know, what my service times are. And of course, I'm one of the few also. <laughs> you remember when they had the fire in the United States records down in St. Louis, Missouri, yeah. destroyed the veterans? Yeah. Thank God I'd had some of my, of my records recorded by the county clerk up in the I had recorded here in Burlington. So I, had, I didn't have them all. But I don't have all of them there either. And, uh, and those are the records that were, you get destroyed. There's no way they can be reproduced. I have a friend that is in that position. Yeah, he can't even, you know, uh, he can't even get uh, the uh, tax thing on his house now. Because his records were destroyed and he never had any copies made. Yeah. I had copies made of mine. And of course, I had, when I got out of the service, one of the first things I did was go to the courthouse and have it recorded. Would they not accept a, a newspaper article, perhaps, oh, no, saying no, no, that no. you went? No, no, there's no. got to be, <laughs> they're, they're paper money, just like that. They, no, I agree with it. Uh, they, I mean, they, they can't tell replace you you've got to have a DD-218. I don't have a DD-218. You don't. <laughs> they didn't have them World War II. They got, they got something else. Said, I keep telling them, I don't have one. Yeah. Well, you got to have one, though. I said, no, you no, know, you don't. No, you know, he didn't get one. I didn't get one. <laughs> They didn't, they weren't, they weren't, they weren't in it. But, but, you know, when I got discharged, I got a sheet of paper, which is long before the DD-218. Oh, yeah. And on the discharge, it shows a service over, your very service overseas yeah. particularly. Right. Mm -hmm. One thing you mentioned on the phone that you haven't said anything about now, if I understood you right, was that you had flown on some A mission or some missions that still weren't even declassified. Did I understand you right about that? They're still under classification. No, I got in at the end of the war. But, uh, no, you see, I'm proud of the fact that I did enlist. Well, it, were you a junior then, in high school? No, I was a senior. Senior in high school. Yeah. See, when, the, when certain materials become classified, I don't know, I don't know how this all works. This is what I've been told. That the only person that can remove the classification is the classifier. 
and if the classifier is dead, that'll never get removed, really. When I went back to high school, I got kicked out one time. Smoked. Of course, everybody smoked in the service, yeah. almost everybody. Yeah. And uh, we'd been across the street from the old high school there in Brooklyn, and for lunch, three of us, all veterans, we were walking up, we were all going back to school, we were walking up the side of there, and D.D. Stonehocker was a captain in the Army. He was, I won't tell you what I think of him. <laughs> but, <laughs> We will came down, down the, the hill. <laughs> he had us all kicked out for three days. And then he tried to get our security. I was going back on the GI Bill and he tried to get that taken away from us. Why well, didn't know what was his reasoning? Or who knows? He tried to do what? He tried to get the, the uh, GI Bill taken away from us because we were kicked out. Why in the world? Oh, uh, <laughs> some people get, rank, get so rank happy. Yeah, they, that's, that was him. He was uh, with the junior college. Uh, he wasn't at the high school, but nevertheless, we got kicked out for three days. And I was taking welding for three hours. Of course, I, I could weld better than this, probably as well as the instructor for that. I learned it before I went to the service in night school. And then I, as a ship fitter, we did an awful lot of welding. Sure. And uh, <coughs> I went back to school the first day after I got kicked out. A fellow by the name of John Wilson, teacher. He said, Jim, I'd like you to come in three nights and uh, three hours at a time to make up for what you cost. I said, okay, that's no problem. I went in the first night, he had me build a pad. And he says, I'll see how bad your welding is. He took that pad and he cut it every which way to go after this and he says, don't come back anymore tonight. He said, you're so far ahead of these people, it's pathetic. <laughs> I said, well, you know, I did an awful lot of that in service as a ship fitter. <laughs> no, I was just going to ask you, what was your, just a thought that came, your, uh, you know, I've read some books about the, the women pilots during that time, and did you encounter any of them? They did, but they, they were not the quantity, and, and usually, they, transport, you know, they were only like they transport, trans you know, they just, they just flew, like, yeah. planes to England yeah. and stuff like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, they, they never were in any combat area. No, we're talking about Frank Yankee. I, I was a patient at Fletcher General Hospital, maybe I told you this story, came back, and that was undergoing treatment. And there was a young, well, he was a medical officer, his name was Bear, the son of Sticks, Bear, and Ford owners in St. Louis, Missouri. That was assigned to the hospital. He, as a doctor, I don't know if he had sense of pork juice out of a boot, but then he was here and there. Uh, and this corpsman 